This is our talk about what if Kubernetes was a compiler target. Um, I'm pretty excited about this. Um, I think it's kind of a nifty novel idea. Um, so hopefully we can kind of show off some of these ideas and uh, influence the uh, direction of distributed computing uh, for the next decade or so. Um, so first off, who are we? Uh, my name's David. Um, I'm a founder and research scientist at Applied Computing Research Labs. Uh, previously, I was at Yelp and at Airbnb doing uh, cloud operations, uh, Kubernetes, Mesos, all that jazz. Um, I'm a contributor to Cluster Autoscaler and to Carpenter. I'm also the maintainer of the SimCube project. Um, we're not talking about any of that today. Um, you can find me on Slack or on Hackyderm uh, or on Blue Sky. Um, my GitHub handle's slightly different. Um, I do want to point out, uh, so this is my colleague, Tim. I'll let him introduce himself, but uh, he's on the job market for internships. So uh, <laughs> if you want to hire him, he's really great. I also have a team of undergrads that I'm working with out there uh, who are also all fantastic and on the job market. So uh, <laughs> if you're hiring, come talk to me, and I'll point you to good people. Okay. Cool, yeah, so as David said, I'm Tim. Um, I'm currently a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and my current research is on the controller programming model, focusing on how to make it easier to debug and ultimately a little more developer friendly. Um, and online or on Mastodon and GitHub, you can find me at T. Goodwin. Um, so let's get into it. So we all know that programming distributed systems is hard. And of course, part of this stems from the challenges that are inherent to the nature of distribution, so things like partial failure and asynchrony. Um, but a lot of it also comes from the way that we typically write these applications. So consider some really conventional user-facing application that has a structure that looks something like this diagram over here. We have a presentation layer, some data layer, and some core business logic connecting the two. To go about implementing such an application, a developer typically has to spread application logic across some front end. Um, they have to write some server-side code and then some additional code to handle interactions with the database. Um, so there's a lot of components here to keep track of. Um, and to get these components working together correctly, a developer has to handle things like network communication, um, data serialization, and format conversion. And in this process, they may have to develop, or sorry, use multiple programming languages and environments. So it'd be great if we could abstract away some of this complexity. And today, or there have been a variety of approaches to this question over the years, um, but today I want to talk about one approach that focuses on allowing developers to write their application as a single program. So this is a paradigm called multi-tier programming, and it originates from the programming languages community. So in multi-tier programming, a developer writes their application as one program that then gets compiled into a distributed system. And in a multi-tier program, the application logic is typically expressed in terms of the logical layers or tiers within the application. Um, and then a compiler will use this tier information to produce a set of independently deployable compilation units that together make a distributed system. So to illustrate what this multi-tier programming process looks like, let's consider some simple distributed chat application where clients can submit messages to some public message board. I'm gonna walk through what it looks like to program this application in a language called Scala Loki, which is a modern multi-tier language um, based on Scala. So to write our Scala Loki chat app, the first thing that we'll do is declare the logical server part of our application. Um, for the client part, we'll do the same thing using what's called a peer type in Scala Loki. So this is Scala Loki's concept for the logical tiers of an application. And in this language, we can also specify how these tiers relate to each other architecturally. So here we're specifying that there's a many to one relationship between client and server. And then to handle clients submitting messages to the public message board, we can use what's called a placement type in Scala Loki. So in this language, both data and functions can be declared with respect to a tier. So here, we're working under a reactive programming paradigm and declaring um, an event type that we're calling message, and it's been declared with respect to the client tier. And then we're also writing a main routine that's similarly placed on the client, in which we're gonna be reading lines from standard in and firing off 
these message events. Now to handle collecting these messages into a public message board, we're gonna use another placement type, but this time on the server. And we're calling this one public message. And note how in the definition of the public message placement type, we're referencing the message placement type, which is on the client. So in doing so, we're implicitly defining the communication protocol between the client part of our application and the server part. So we have one more step to take care of, which is serving these public message, the public message board back to each client, and we're gonna follow the same pattern here. We're going to make a reference to the public message placement type from within that main routine that we defined on the client. And this is defining how data flows back from the server to the client. And this is our full program. We're done implementing our distributed chat app in Scala Loki in about a dozen lines of code. So this is pretty great. We're operating at a much higher level of abstraction um, than we would be if we were doing this the microservices way. And throughout this process, we were able to entirely avoid any plumbing code. There's no RPC boilerplate in here. All of that stuff is taken care of for us by the compiler. So pretty cool, right? Well, I should say this is just one example demo app. This is one multi-tier language. The things that we see here won't necessarily generalize to the types of applications that we're writing, say, at our day jobs. Um, and part of this is due to one of the limitations of the multi-tier approach in that the approach is pretty reliant on tiers already being evident in the structure of your application. So this paradigm doesn't work as well for more general applications where the inherent structure can be a little bit more arbitrary. Um, but I do want to call out a style of framework that shares a lot of similar goals to multi-tier programming, but have typically been targeted more towards enterprise use cases. So I guess you could call this style of framework a framework for building distributed component applications, where here the idea is that developers encapsulate their application logic into some predefined frameworks and then some runtime is gonna figure out how to deploy and ultimately integrate those components as a distributed system. So some notable examples of this style of framework were developed in the 90s. Microsoft's distributed component object model. You may have heard of Enterprise Java Beans. Um, and even just last year, Google announced a framework in this style called Service Weaver. But this style of framework does come with its own set of challenges. One of the big ones is that it imposes a pretty rigid application um, structure um, on the types of apps that, it's, that you can um, build with it. And also using a framework like this typically requires committing to a certain uh, vendor ecosystem or some set of APIs that can make it otherwise pretty challenging to integrate apps built this way with the services that you're already running or the code that you already have. Um, and historically, these types of frameworks haven't really seen super widespread adoption. But I still think it's interesting to think about some of these ideas we've just reviewed and contemplate how we might apply them to the apps that we're already writing in our day-to-day -day lives or the apps that we're currently using Kubernetes to uh, manage. How might we use some of these ideas to make it so that we don't even have to worry about the microservices part of the applications that we're writing? Or rather, what if some of these ideas could be used to allow us to keep the architectural benefits of microservices, but preserve the simplicity of writing our applications as if they were monoliths? So these questions lead me to the title question of our talk. What if Kubernetes was a compiler target? And for an answer to that question, I'm now gonna pass it off to my colleague, David, um, who has a live demo prepared for us. Cool. Um, thanks for the overview there. Um, before I go into the demo, um, I just want to uh, talk to you about what you're about to see. So you might recall this diagram uh, from a few slides ago um, where our multi-tier program gets converted into separate binaries by a multi-tier compiler, um, and these run in different locations. So you might run in the browser or on the JVM. Um, more generally, uh, we think of like your presentation tier, your business logic tier, and your data tier. Um, what we find is that uh, companies that are running on top of Kubernetes still 
mentally are architecting or thinking about their application in terms of these three tiers, but the microservices that they're actually writing uh, don't necessarily fall into those like cleanly defined buckets. Um, you just have a whole bunch of pods that are running on your cluster somewhere. So the idea is, uh, let's throw that out and let's use this diagram instead. So here you've got your program. Um, we've got some sort of compiler that's going to take our program and it's going to turn it into Kubernetes applications. And so the unit of execution for multi-tier programming is the binary, like the application binary that gets run somewhere. Uh, and you can think of for Kubernetes, the unit of execution is your container. And so our Kubernetes compiler is going to take a single code base and it's going to convert it into container images that can be deployed onto your Kubernetes cluster. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do this. Um, I'm not the first to have this idea. I'm definitely not gonna be the last. Uh, what I'm doing in this demo is targeting Golang specifically. Um, Golang's a really cool language. It's got a lot of neat ideas. Um, I think the defining uh, characteristic, the reason why Go is so popular and so successful is because it makes concurrency super easy. Um, it's very easy to spin up a new Go routine and just take advantage of all of the threads and all of the cores on your machine. And so the key idea in the project I'm gonna show you today is we're gonna take those Go routines and we're going to turn them into Kubernetes pods. Okay, so now we're running stuff on different nodes, but we still have to have some way of communicating back and forth. In Go, this is done through channels. So we're gonna take those channels and we're gonna convert them into network requests. Easy peasy. Now you've taken a program that can run on a single machine and now you can run it on your cluster. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. So um, I'm gonna preface this again. Uh, Everything I'm showing you here is real. Uh, there's no like, uh, there's no like magic demo uh, sauce that like isn't going to work in a real cluster or something like that. However, uh, it probably only works in this specific setting. So this isn't even like alpha code. This is like pre 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 alpha code. Okay. Uh, so just to, just so that we're all on the same page there, yeah. Um, but imagine that you are writing some sort of a photo, photo processing app. Um, I'm gonna show you some example code here. Um, we've written this code in Go, um, and this is gonna look, I think, pretty familiar to you. Um, we've got our main entry point here. Um, your users can upload photos to this application, and we do some sort of resource-intensive processing. So here you can see we've established an endpoint that our users can hit, um, and it calls this upload image. Um, in here, we do a little bit of request validation. Uh, in a like production service, you can imagine you're doing user authentication, all this other stuff before you get to the actual like processing part of your application. Um, but when you get down to the processing part, you spin that out in a Go routine. Um, and the reason why you might wanna do that is uh, it's resource intensive. You don't want your user to sit and wait 10 seconds or a minute or five minutes for that network request to complete before uh, they get some indication of whether this is gonna succeed or not. So you spin that off um, and then we immediately return to the user a job ID. Um, and they can check this out uh, and say like, okay, here's your job ID, check it out when it's finished and uh, you'll get your photo back. So I actually have this running right now. Um, this is a local cluster that's running on my laptop. Um, you can imagine, of course, this is running in the cloud. Um, this is a pod that's running the same code that I just show you. Um, I'm also over here, I've set up port forwarding so that I can actually access the pod. Um, and let's go ahead and try it out. Okay, so I've posted an image to this pod. It immediately returns back a job ID. And again, this is all running locally. You can see that it's now returned an image that has done some sort of processing. This is the image that I uploaded. Uh, this is my avatar on all the socials, so if you see this, it's me. Um, we can come over here and, hey, it processed the image. It's like half the size now or something, okay? Um, and you know, I could show, this is taking a little bit of time, right? Like, it's really, really hard to resize this image. Really hard. 
Oh, there it is. We're all done. Okay, cool. So you've built this application, uh, and you're getting some users, and you're getting a lot of traction, and all of a sudden you can't run it locally anymore. Um, you need to somehow take this application and split it up so that it can run in a distributed context uh, so that you can handle all of the load that you're getting. So you could spin up a whole platform team to uh, you know, uh, manage your Kubernetes infrastructure, and then you could spin up all of these teams to handle all of the different microservices, or you could not do that. Um, that'd be cool too. Um, so what I'm gonna show you here is how you can compile this application directly to Kubernetes. So here, uh, compile is the Kubernetes compiler that we've written. Um, and you can see that I'm passing in uh, the same source file that we had before. Um, actually, before I run that, I'm just gonna show you that this is doing real stuff. Uh, this is the output directory where uh, these binaries are gonna get created. You can see there's nothing there right now. Okay, so the first thing that it's doing is it's looking for Go routines in my source file, and it's, you know, it's actually like parsing the Go AST to find these Go routines and doing like a, it's basically doing a big find and replace. Um, it finds one and it replaces that with a create pod request and it replaces any channels that it finds with HTTP endpoints. Okay, and like I said before, uh, the unit of execution for Kubernetes is a container. And so not only are we doing this AST parsing, we're also building Docker images for the two binaries, or the two applications that we're now gonna be running. So if we go back into our output directory, you can see that we've now created two distinct applications. Um, one of these I'm calling the controller. This is like the entry point that your user is going to interact with your service with. So again, this is going to be the URL that I uh, curl uh, to process my photos. And the other is the actual like hard part. This is where this is the thing that's doing all of the work. So let's look at the code in the controller for a minute. Okay, so here you can see uh, this looks sort of similar. Uh, we still have our main function here. Um, it is still registering an upload endpoint um, that you can post images to. Um, and let's look and see what that function's now doing. Um, again, we're doing like our request validation over here. Um, this big block of code right here used to be our go routine call. Now, uh, we're doing something different. We are creating a Kubernetes pod. We're waiting for that to come up. And then we are sending all of the photo data over HTTP to that pod. Now, you recall that the, pod, that the uh, process also returns a job ID, which immediately gets returned back to the user so they can check on the progress of their application. Um, the way that that works is we're now setting up a separate HTTP endpoint for the reverse communication. This is all done, again, programmatically. Okay, and then we can take, oops, sorry. Uh, we can take a brief look at the sort of service code. Um, this is now uh, a full application. So it has a entry point. It has, you know, a main function. Um, we're establishing an HTTP endpoint that can be used sort of internally in our cluster. And up here, we're doing all of the hard work of resizing our image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now deploy this to my cluster. Okay, so you can see now I've got two different things running here. Uh, this demo down here, this is the original app that I showed you before. Um, controller is now the new thing that I just compiled, okay? What I'm gonna do over here is I'm going to now set up port forwarding for the controller, okay? And we're going to make the same network request that we did before. Takes a little bit longer, but then it immediately returns back a job ID. Okay, that's kind of cool. Uh, so what's going on under the hood? Let's take a look. Now you see, oh, there's a new pod. Um, it's running, and it succeeded. So we can actually look at our, like, abstracts, or like our data storage. Again, this is on my laptop, but you imagine this is S3 or something like that, okay? Now here we've got the new uh, photo that we just processed, okay? 
We can do that a bunch of times. I don't know, how many, how many copies of this photo do you want me to process? Eight, eight? Uh, what is this, six, seven, eight, I'm not doing 100, sorry. Okay, but look, uh, we now have all of these pods that have been spun up uh, to process our images. Um, as soon as they're done processing the image, they shut down. So another way you can think about this is like, uh, compiling into functions as a service, right? This is a like, different way of doing Lambda functions, for example. We spin up the pod when we need it. As soon as it's done, then it shuts down. And I don't know if you believe me or not. Hopefully you do. But look, all, all the images are here now. OK? Ta-da. So just to wrap up, um, I want to talk a little bit about what we learned. Um, Tim you know, started off talking about multi-tier programming, um, which is this idea of taking one program and compiling it into different tiers. Um, this is not multi-tier programming. Compile, the thing I just showed you, is not that, but it's very, very closely related ideas. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the challenges that we've run into a, with this programming paradigm a lot in the past is it requires really specialized tools or specialized programming languages or like going into, like structuring your application code in a very particular way or like annotating it in comments or something like that. Uh, Tim mentioned Service Weaver, which is this thing that Google put out. Uh, super cool project. Uh, was really excited when they announced it. Um, the highlighted bit here is, I think, the important part. Uh, Service Weaver is being shut down because it was hard for users to adopt Service Weaver directly because it required re rewriting large parts of existing applications. Um, so this is the same thing that you know Tim and I have both sort of pointed out. Um, this was also this less is, than a week ago. Yeah, this was this like last happened. week. Um, and this is not like like this is not a Google shuts everything down thing. Uh, this is like Google has some really really smart people working on this, um, and this is super cool tech. Um, this is just pointing out that this is a really hard problem that's still like open. Like nobody knows how to solve this. Like I don't know how to solve this. Like I did it in this demo app thing, but like you can't take that and run it on any real production code. Um, so what I really am hoping that you all take away from this talk is uh, there are programming paradigms that we haven't come up with yet. Uh, Kubernetes has become the platform that we're running our stuff on. Now I want to try to think about what are the programming paradigms that support the platform or that can use that platform. So again, the thing that we wrote, compile, uh, this shows a way that we could do it for a generic programming language like Go. I make no claims that this is the way to do it, but uh, again, I really hope to kind of inspire you to think outside the box about uh, what we can be doing here. Um, one consequence of doing something like compile is that uh, we're gonna be writing a lot less YAML um, because the compiler is going to do all of that for you. And I know that makes all the YAML engineers in here really sad. So sorry about that. Um, we're going to wrap up. We've got about 10 minutes left uh, if there are any questions. Uh, this is not a comprehensive list or literature survey of multi-tier programming or any, like, any of the related fields. Um, this is just a starting point. So the top thing there is a survey paper that discusses uh, Scala Loki and a whole bunch of these other different types of multi-tier efforts. Um, that second link there is actually like the Scala Loki paper. So if you want to learn more about that, and then there's they have a whole like uh, website where you can go and like write some sample applications and stuff like that. Um, the third paper there is Google's Service Weaver paper. Uh, definitely read that, it's super cool. Um, and then the last link there is just a link to our GitHub where I have all of the source code for this demo. Um, so that's all that we have today. Uh, would love to take any questions that you have. Uh, there's, a, I think, a microphone um, if uh, folks can queue up over there. So uh, a little bit of lore about David. 
Uh, he oh, wrote no. a blog post about this in the internal Yelp confluence about two or three years ago, maybe a little longer than that. Maybe well, like four five, years. But yeah. So it is super cool to see this come together. Um, it's certainly something that you've all been working on for quite some time. The question I have is actually around where you see the limits. Like, where is the ceiling for this? Or do you actually see this becoming something that you can write arbitrary line of business offer around? Um, really good question. Uh, I think the limits that we're, like the current limits that we're struggling with is, like even with what I showed you, you would have to structure your program in a fairly specific way for it to work. Um, it's looking for channels and go routines, but if you don't, like, if they're in different function blocks or if they're in like different, you know, sort of source files or something like that, that's not gonna, it's not gonna work in that environment. So figuring out like how to connect all the pieces without having to massively restructure your source code, I think is a huge challenge. Um, the second challenge that, so like, let's say we solve that. Um, the second challenge that uh, I think is still sort of unanswered is like, is this actually a good idea? Um, <laughs> There are, so, so the monolith versus microservices thing is partly a tech thing, but it's also partly a people thing. Like we split things into microservices so that teams have like a defined chunk of code that they can own and iterate on without having to uh, worry about like the code that's over here. And so um, this doesn't solve the like people and the teams side of this. This is just a tech thing. And so I think that's a huge challenge we still need to understand. So I guess one follow-on question for you, David. Um, let's assume that we have a yucky but works way of mapping between like go routines and channels and so on, and the kinds of things you'd normally want to do in like a nice, boring web application framework. What would be the advantages of running that typical like Django Python program in this model? Like, where do you see the the, the upside being there? So. I think, actually, Tim, if you want to jump in, too, like on the Hologa stage. Um, but uh, I think that the advantage comes from, like, now you can do these sorts of functions as a service thing kind of for free. Or, like, we don't have to do functions as a service. Like, we could also write the compiler so that it just creates a deployment uh, that's doing your photo processing. And now that thing's getting scaled by HPA or by Keta or by whatever you want. And so now, like, that bit is uh, being independently scaled. And if we really wanted to be fancy, you could theoretically take your compiler, hook it into your Prometheus metrics to identify the hot spots in your code and say, OK, this is the bit that I need to extract out so that we can take advantage of Kubernetes. And all this other stuff over here doesn't matter, so leave it alone. Right, do you have anything you want to say? That was what I was going to say, pretty much. It would be cool to envision this thing being hooked up to like some GitOps type thing where your program gets recompiled in response to its performance metrics. Super. Thank you, Bill. Hello. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm not a compiler writer, but I was wondering uh, how do you write how do you write that compiler? Uh, what do you use? And, and... So uh, Going actually comes built in with this really usable and great um, AST package, which allows you to um, produce in Golang the AST structure of your program. So AST stands for Abstract Syntax Tree. So the basic idea is like you write down like the characters, um, those get uh, translated into like more abstract concepts inside the programming language. And this forms a nice tree structure that you can then parse and sort of walk through. And then whenever you see like a, like a channel or a go routine, you just put in the, the pods or, or, or the service? Yep. Mm. So in more like traditional compiler, like programming language research, you've got a bunch of phases you go through. You go through like a parser and a lexer, and then like the compiler itself is doing multiple passes to sort of do optimization and all of these sorts of things. Um, you could translate all of those concepts into this sort of framework as well. Uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to figure out how to not phrase this as a comment. Um, Comments are you, fine. Do you think that um, the Erlang runtime is an example of multi-tier programming? 
That's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of those like enterprise frameworks that I briefly mentioned are heavily inspired by Erlang or sort of this notion of actors being um, location transparent. Um, but I wouldn't say, I mean, I haven't written too many programs purely in the actor model, but I wouldn't say that Erlang is fully multi-tier and that I think it allows you to be pretty flexible with respect to how your application um, can be structured, whereas multi-tier is kind of relying on these um, implicit tier layer type things in like the domain that you're working in. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, we've got five minutes, or four yeah, minutes. First of all, thank you very much for expanding in the world of compilers. This is something that most of the time private sector doesn't touch, that's why it's more academic. It's super nebulous and that's actually the fundamental of my question. Um, I, we, here we, we are mostly are, um, we apply engineering, right? So we, we, are, we, we materialize um, your ideas or stuff that the architects have. And my question is, we have been seeing like in the evolution of programming in general, um, how do we keep adding abstraction layer, layers? And I'm glad you mentioned the, the Java enterprise approach. I remember it was like, like kind of a huge revolution because we were producing this war package that comes with the UI, right? With the, um, with the back end and everything in just one package that the platform is able to, to apply. And only that, that thing was like very, um, it, it was like a huge event, but also brought a whole new problem in organizations where we are adding more boulder plate um, in such a point that it's making it hard to debug. So imagine yeah. this level of abstraction you are presenting here. Um, I agree, it's amazing, it's, it's very nice. I really like it and, and thank you to dedicate time to this because it's, it's really, somebody needs to do it. Otherwise we are gonna be stuck, so you, you guys uh, clap for you. But how do you visualize a future where we have this level of abstraction in terms of um, uh, debugging and, and problem solving, should we like be very positive and think maybe AI will fix the <laughs> debug this for us in the future? I don't know, yes, conjecturating. I mean, we already have a crazy amount of abstraction in just Kubernetes. Um, the amount of like YAML that gets translated to control loops under the hood somewhere that we don't know how to debug is pretty overwhelming. Um, so I would say that like, I don't think that abstraction is bad. Um, I think you have to target your abstraction really carefully. And so like, I make no claims that this is the like, right way to target your abstraction. This is a way that you can do it. Um, I don't know that we, as distributed systems engineers, I don't know if we actually know what the right abstractions are for the code that we want to write. And I think one interesting thing with distributed systems is there are some abstractions that are never going to not leak. Like you can't mask partial failure over the network. Some approaches like, I'm not super familiar with actually coding in enterprise Java beans, but I think a lot of those types of systems um, were really hard to debug because when you don't know what's a function call versus a network request, you can get really unpredictable performance, um, to name an example. So I think, I mean, this is just a prototype, but if we were to continue working on this, we'd try to not pretend like the network no. isn't there anymore. We'd try and be maybe a little yeah. more transparent about, this is yeah, we're spinning up a pod. Uh, about your prototype, it's in the way it is. And if you can make reliably work in the way it is without adding anything else, this, this could perfectly be, um, an option for something like Airflow. Mm -hmm. You can define your jobs, you know, you don't need to use, it's, I, I see value on this, like, in the way it is, like, it's, it's amazing. So, yeah. uh, great job, guys. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Uh, to follow up with, like, the Erlang question, uh, functional programming has a, a rich history of uh, uh, static analysis and program transformation-based techniques to turn what, does not have description of multi-tier, like explicit multi-tier annotations into something that looks like multi-tier. Have you looked at that at all when you were discussing, uh, is this a good idea going forward of uh, what kind of programs could be transformed this way? I guess we haven't fully discussed next steps since we've been sort of 
only focusing on the Go routine use case where that's the only type of thing we're swapping out. Um, but like in this survey of multi-tier programming paper, there's a lot of techniques discussed that combine static analysis with maybe some type system features, and some languages also use user annotations. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess for our prototype, maybe as it approaches an alpha release or something, we could envision us sprinkling in user annotations or getting a little bit more structure in there to make the compiler part more powerful. Cool. Um, We're out of time. Uh, I'll just say I love static analysis, so I think that's a really great idea. So thank you. <laughs>